Yes, sir. Shushikan, sir, you may start. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. I am Shashikant Gupta, and uh, today we are here to learn about the scientific advancements towards peace and harmony from Dr. R. K. Thakur. So, Professor R. K. Thakur is a professor in physics and dean the School of Basic and Applied Sciences at the University. He has more than 22 years of experience in research, teaching, and academic administration. He has served, uh, he served on several academic and research positions in leading higher educational institutes in Germany, Hong Kong, and Italy. Professor Thakur holds a PhD in ICT in education and also a PhD in experimental nanocondensed matter physics from the Constant University, Germany. Uh, where he had expertise in uh, low temperature physics and ultra high vacuum, vacuum surface physics. He also holds a master's degree from Padova University, Italy. Professor Thakur has received several international awards and fellowships, such as the GFT German Research Foundation Fellowship, the famous DAD Fellowship from Germany, the Hong Kong Government Fellowship, the INFN Fellowship which is funded by the European Research Council. Today he will speak on scientific advancement towards peace and harmony post-World War II. The session will highlight the destruction of thousands of lives during the Second World War and its devastating effect on the balance of the society. Followed by this, the speaker will introduce advancements in the science and technology after the World War and its significant contribution in restoring the peace and harmony in the society. I welcome all the participants and I and now I invite Professor Dr. Thakur to start the session. Please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Sasikant Guptaji, for uh, introduction. And uh, today, Dear colleagues, as you know, we are going to conduct a eighth session of this SDP, Student Development Program. And uh, here, as Dr. Gupta already mentioned about the title, the scientific advancement toward peace and harmony after the Second World War. To, after the Second World War. So how, what, which kind of the discovery later post Second World War that was or that is still beneficial for the mankind not only for the human being or also also for the nature so i will focus there my talk especially on those physical chemical biological mathematical and forensic aspects so all together physical sciences and mathematical sciences well prior going to start my ppt uh, can you see my PPT here? Good. Is it uh, visible on the screen? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know what happened. Okay, so now, no, I think it is, is it stressed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And my, video, my video is off, right? Dr. Chaudhary? Yes, uh, yes sir. sir. Your video is off. Yes, sir, it's off. Okay, okay. video is off. Yes. Oh. Fine. So I will go with the content. However, prior going to the original content toward a scientific advancement toward peace and harmony. Tomorrow is a teacher's day, 5th of September. So there, prior to that, I would like to extend uh, my heartfelt thanks and congratulations to all uh, the community, fraternity member, teachers, students. Actually, dear colleagues, it is teacher in a classroom who takes action and helps a student to achieve academic, sporting, 
cultural and lifelong learning goal. Therefore, may I take this opportunity to also thank, thank teachers for their continuous professionalism, excellence, and dedication so far. It is, believe me, it is a teacher's motivation in the classroom that help to create a year that is brighter with the embraced opportunity for all the learned people, all the people who have achieved out, say, whatsoever milestone in their life. Therefore, let you also take immense pride in belonging to this novel profession of teaching and manifest the immense potential within you to inspire millions of minds by your scholastic contribution and innovative genius. So I again thank all the colleagues, all the faculty members. Now moving on forward, so as you know, I'm going to speak about the scientific advancement toward peace and harmony post Second World War. But prior to that, it is necessary to understand that from the discovery of metal up to mapping the human genome, take a quick press through the development of scientific knowledge. Humankind has always been inquisitive, needing to understand why things behave in a certain way and trying to link observations with the predictions. For example, since prehistoric time, we have observed the heavens and tried to make sense of seasonal changes in the position of sun, moon, and stars. For example, in about 4000 BC, the Mesopotamians tried to explain their observations by suggesting that the earth was at the center of the universe and that the other heavenly bodies moved around it. So humans have always been interested in the nature and origin of the universe. And, but they were not only interested in astronomy. The ex, uh, extraction of iron, which led to the iron is, or is a chemical process which early metallurgists developed without understanding any of the science involved. Nevertheless, they were still able to optimize the extraction of trial and error. So after the human settlement, human civilization, slowly they moved further and worked on the medicine. And then the Greeks, the Greek were the first people to try and develop the theory behind the observations. People such as Pythagoras, who concentrated, concentrated on mathematical views of the world. Similarly, Aristotle and Plato developed logical methods for examining the world around them. So, in contrast, if I had to say how the modern science took birth or took place, then we roughly say that it was in the 17th century that modern science was really born and the world began to be examined more closely using instruments such as the telescope, microscope, clock, barometer, and it also, it was also at this time that the scientific laws started to be put forward for such a phenomenon as a gravity and the way that the temperature of a gas are related. So in the 18th century, much of biological or chemistry was developed as a part of age of and moving toward the 19th century, saw some of the great names of science, people like a chemistry in a John Dalton who developed the atomic theory of matter, Michael Faraday and James Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, who both put forward theories concerning electricity and magnetism and Charles Darwin who proposed the theory of evaluation. Each of these development forced scientists radically to re-examine their views of the way in which the world worked. Excuse this is me, the sir? picture of our Giriwenka University, a very less green 65 acre campus. And so I have already spoke about the science. Science is, what is science? Science is just a body of systematic knowledge concerning the relationship between cause and its effect. So whatever we study today in science, that goes in the past as a history of science. So we always believe that science is a dynamic. So, so these are some facts about the science education. In principle, 
students in general life fails to see that science is in nature all around them and the scientific method is widely applicable in a different aspect of their life so the problem is not just how much science a student learn but how they connect science to their life and society that is much more important so as i already focused on the historic prospect so dear colleagues in the last century that about discoveries such as relativity and quantum mechanics so which again required scientific scientists to took at things in a completely different way it makes you wonder what the icon plastic discoveries of this century will be so whatsoever the science and technology we have achieved in 21st century that is by dint of the hard work of human civilization thousands years before so as you know during uh, by the way dr choudhury slides are changing yes sir right great so dear colleagues as you know during the second world war whatsoever the science was discovered and during the second world war the nuclear bombs that destroyed the japan almost and other bombs also destroyed many uh, european countries like uh, england russia germany france and so many other countries including united states and japan so that was destroyed due to somehow the misuse of the science the nuclear bombs that was somehow uh, uh, advocated by albert einstein and then many uh, physicists chemists uh, genius scientists involved in manhattan project including richard feynman otto hahn and so many other people and but that complete world saw the devastation so afterward <clears throat> it was a big discussion across the world among scientific community societal intellectual that science we have developed we have human civilization has worked so hard in last thousands of year and we achieved something and that was somehow misused so now this is the time to use the science for the benefit of society to improve the life quality of life of the people to improve the natural resources to improve the natural phenomenon and so on. and there as you can see my slides sure i'm sure you know now he is none other than the linus carl pauling a uh, novel laureate was born on a 28th of february it is also we celebrate science day in our country on the birth of raman effect so this you know it is a just a coincident linus carl pauling was born on 28th of february 1901 and passed away in a 19th of august 1994 so dear colleagues it was linus carl pauling who took courage to bring all the societal intellectuals social workers scientists nobel laureates more than 10000 and got say signed a pact that we should not use misuse the nuclear power we should use the science for the benefit of society for the benefit of human being to improve the quality of life across the world and to retain or improve the natural uh, prospects and as you can see here he was awarded nobel prize for his outstanding discovery in chemistry in 1954 and following that he also received 19 62 peace nobel peace prize and in the history of 119 year of nobel prize he is the only one person who received twice undivided unshared nobel prize though in the history there are many four five people who received twice nobel prize you know marie curie you might be knowing then uh, say um, the person who has discovered a transistor um, but, john bardeen jordan bardeen received twice nobel prize and so few other other people also received twice nobel prize but everyone has shared by sheer 
it was answered. The most important thing is he was a scientist, received Nobel Prize for chemistry, fine. But the second Nobel Prize for the use of science for the peaceful manner to establish peace and harmony on this planet. Make this earth surface amicable for each and everyone. For that he received and that's why it is considered as a, one of the most distinguished, say, person in the history of human civilization. Now, I will come towards some other aspect like uh, environmental discoveries. And so, as you know, environmental aspects are one of the most important because if the environment is good, air is purified, pure, water is pure, we can live our life longer. Else, if our health is not good, we can't do anything. That's why we kept, I kept this uh, presentation on environmental science on top. So here are some timelines I can just show you. Like for example, in 1948, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, that was, that influence, encourage and assist societies throughout the world to conserve nature and to ensure that any use of natural resources is equitable and ecologically sustainable. And so in 1950, one Mahotsa, 1951, World Meteorological Organization, and in 1954, the first nuclear power plant to generate electricity for, uh, say, uh, for a power grid started operation at Omni Soviet Union was established. So all that led a peaceful, <coughs> say, settlement of human and uh, helped improve the quality of life. So in the 1956, you can see Minamata disease, 1958, Mauna Lava Observatory initiated monitoring of atmospheric carbon dioxide, CO2 levels, 1961, World, World, World Wildlife Fund in Switzerland work for conservation research and restoration of natural environment and so on. In 1962, Louis Rachel Caron, 1968, the Apollo 8 and picture of Earthwise Apollo 8 was the first crewed spacecraft to leave Earth low, low Earth orbit and the first to reach the moon orbit it and return. Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Andrews, the first human to fly to the moon to witness the photograph on Earth's rise, and so on. So here, these are also some other establishment, like in 1970, Norman Borlaug, the father of a Green Revolution, he received a Nobel Peace Prize for his outstanding contribution for the environmental studies. In 1962, the Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm. Then in 1974, chloro chlorocarbons are first hypothesized to cause ozonic things and so on. In 1978, 1978, Lowell canal contamination revealed in a neighborhood of Nigeria, Niagara Falls, New York, in 1979, three mile island that was nuclear power accident in the US history. All that happened. In 1982, World Charter for Nature was adopted by United Nations on October 28 to follow principle of conservation by which all human conduct affecting nature is to be guided and judged. And so here you can see one of the most, say, Compassionate picture, I believe, in 1984, the Bhopal disaster in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh, because that was just because of the human error, the methyl isocyanide leakage in the midnight of 2nd December, 2nd and 3rd December, that led thousands of lives lost immediately after. In 1985, the Antarctic ozone hole discovered and so on. So here you can see all these timelines are that was say to improve the quality of life, to improve the uh, uh, say uh, environmental aspects for the benefit of human and wildlife on the surface. So now moving towards the some most intriguing discoveries in the um, 
field of chemistry. So starting from, again, the Linus Carl Pauling, I have already spoke about the valence bond method proposed by Linus Pauling. He was a professor of California Tech Institute, so-called Caltech. We, if you remember last day, we had a, one talk from Dr. Nayak. He also worked as a postdoctoral fellow for six, seven years at Caltech. So then coming to the Robert S. Millicons, Millicon also showed that the combination of metal oxide calculation with the experimental spectroscopic results that provides a powerful tool for describing bonding in large molecules and so on. So these are some most intriguing discoveries done by the pioneering people like Sir Henry Taube, the Henry Taube from Stanford University was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1983 for his work on a mechanism of electron transfer reaction, especially in a metal complexes. Then Rudolf and Marcus, <coughs> Marcus received Nobel Prize for his <coughs> theory predicted how the rate varies with the driving force for the reaction. That is the difference in energy between reactant and products and counters to intuitions he found that it does not increase continuously but goes through a maximum so he received he was awarded the Nobel prize for a chemistry in 1992 then we come to kenik fukui a japanese professor he was also considered as a frontier orbital for um, um, introducing frontier orbital theory in 1952 then <clears throat> John Popol, who received also the Nobel Prize for his work in theoretical chemistry and uh, awarded in 1998. Then you can see here the John Kendrew and Max Perutz. Then coming to the development of stereochemistry, here John Confrog and Vladimir Prelog and the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1975 was awarded to John Warkup, Karnforth and Vladimir Prelog for their research in stereochemistry. Now for the discovery of supermolecular chemistry. So the idea is to just give you some brief introduction about some pioneer work done in this field. Otherwise, there are, it is not possible to list everyone and is, explain their discoveries. So my approach is just to inform you, provide you the information about some pioneering work, who has done what they have done and how it was recognized by the international scientific community or the Nobel committee. So <clears throat> here you can see that this work was recognized by the Nobel Prize in 1987, which was shared by Donald C. Krem and Jean Mary Lynn and Charles J. Pedersen. Then development in NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, as you can see here at the right hand side, we have a picture. And for this, Richard R. Ernest at ETH, ETH is in Zurich, Switzerland, was given the Nobel Prize for a chemistry in 1991 for the development of methodology of high resolution nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So Ernest methodology has now made it possible to determine the structure in solution of large molecules such as proteins and it is widely used by not only uh, chemists but also for the biologist and physicist as well. Now the discovery of human cause of ozone depletion. So here you can see uh, three scientists, Paul Clurzon, Sherwood, Roland and Mario Molina. So three shared the Nobel Prize in 1995 for their work in atmospheric and environmental chemistry. So now further coming to the discovery of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is equally important in all aspects in physical sciences, mathematical sciences and engineering. So <clears throat> here you can see the discovery of carbon fluorine in 1985, in which 60 or 60 carbon atoms are bound together in cluster in the form of a ball. 
and the designation Fullerton is taken from the name of a uh, American architect R. Buckminster Fuller, who had designed a dome having the form of football of for a 1967 Montreal World Exhibition, and so on. So now the development of lithium-ion battery, which is uh, say one of our most powerful source for our uh, electronic gadgets and devices so far. So for this, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2019 was awarded to John B. Goodenough, M. Stanley, Whittingham and Akira Yoshino for the development of lithium ion battery. It is a, one of a milestone in chemistry. So now coming quickly towards say the imminent biological discoveries. So I hope uh, you can listen me carefully, uh, clearly. Yes, sir. Is it voice is clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, clear. Okay, and how much time do I have? Sir, you have 28 minutes. 28 minutes, okay. But we have yes. to leave some room for the questions as well. So, okay, dear yes, sir. So, now we okay. come to some biological uh, 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 discoveries after the Second World War. So here, the Ken Cladiria Clink, he is an atmospheric scientist who works at a Cornell Institute for Science Department of Global Ecology. So he is actually a world renowned for modeling and other works on phenomena like ocean acidification, the carbon cycle of atmosphere, ocean, and a long-term evaluation of climate and geochemical cycles, and so on. Warren M. Washington, born in 1936 is still going on an american atmospheric science scientist a former chair of a national science board recently working as a senior scientist at the national center for atmospheric research he won the Taylor prize in 2019 alongside dr michael and Ma, and so on these early models allowed science his all discoveries that allowed the scientists contemporary scientists to predict the image of increasing carbon dioxide and were instrumental to the 2007 intergovernmental panel on climate change assessment for which dr washington shared the 2007 nobel peace prize as well now the roger y tai y sin he is a professor of pharmacology, chemistry, and biochemistry in the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. So, dear colleagues, you can see how science is interdisciplinary. People, one chemist, one biologist can contribute in a physics, in a pharmacy, in a chemistry, in a biological science, in a biochemistry, biotechnology, medicine, and so on. So, Dr. Sin designed many high informatic fluorescent reporters of signaling and gen expression in live cells and creatively used them to elucidate fundamental mechanism of calcium signaling and synapting plasticity. So he won a number of awards, included the Hanken Prize in 2002 for his outstanding work on a green fluorescent proteins. Francis S. Collin is a genetic geneticist famous for his invention of disease genus and human genome project. Served as a director of the National Human Genome Research Institute for about nine years. He was recently appointed working as a director in a National Institute of Health, United States, appointed by former then President Barack Obama in 2009, and so on. So, Thomas C. Rake, so he served as a president to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and shared the 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Sidney Altman. In a 1982, Tom Keck and his research group announced the discovery of self expressing RNA provided the first exception to the long-held belief that biological reactions are always catalytic by protein. And so 
his discoveries was were quite fruitful for the peers now selim waxman waxman in 1942 suggested the world antibiotic coined in 1989 by p Bulemin after dr j e flying the editor of biological abstract asked him to suggest a term of chemical substance including compounds and preparation that predicted by microbes and have antimicrobial properties and so on. So he also discovered a streptocin antibiotic in 1943. The drug acts by interfering with the ability of a microorganism to synthesize a certain vital protein. It was the first antimicrobial agent developed after penicillin and the first antibiotic effective in treating tuberculosis like uh, dangerous disease as well. So he received a Nobel Prize in Physiology or a Medicine in 1952. <clears throat> now Thomas Weller. Thomas Weller, he was born in 1915 and passed away just 12 years before 2008. Virologist Thomas Weller with his colleague in 1946 developed a technique to grow polio virus in test tube culture of human tissues. So you know how important his discovery was. So this approach gave virologists a practical tool for the isolation and study of viruses. And for his outstanding contribution, he was awarded conferred with the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology in 1954. So, and so. In 1954, he was awarded the George Ledley Prize in the recognition of his research on rubella, polio, and so on. So, moving on, we have some, I would like to introduce some uh, forensic scientists, their contribution as well worldwide and in an Indian context like Alec J. Jeffrey, genetic, he's a genetic professor and considered as a father of DNA fingerprinting. Fingerprinting is one of the most important aspect in forensic science. So, Sir Jeffrey is a professor of genetics at the University of Leicester, United Kingdom. He's a winner of world oldest science quiz, Capel Medal, believed to be the world's oldest scientific prize announced by the Royal Society of London, United Kingdom. So, he is a British genetics who developed technique for genetic fingerprinting and DNA profiling, which uses variations in the genetic code to identify individuals and so on. So the DNA profiling is a forensic technique in a crime investigation comparing criminal suspects and so on. Now the Martin and James as it is a James and Martin, two modern gas chromatographer who it was invented by this duo, Martin and James in 1952 and has become one of the most important and widely applied analytical techniques in forensic science worldwide. So as we know, the chromatography is a technique that is used to separate out mixtures of substance into the different chemicals that they are compared, comprised of. It is therefore used extensively in one form or another in a forensic laboratories to separate different chemicals in a substance of interest, which can then be identified through other means as well. So the basic chromatography can be tracked back to the turn of 20th century, but it was in 1952 that Anthony James and Martin presented their paper on a gas chromatography, a more refined technique that is now by far the most used chromatographic technique in the forensic science and so on. So a spect a spectrographic voice identification. Voice ident identification is say one of the most important aspect also in a forensic science, the forensic speakers identification is the application of science to solve the problem related to identification of unknown speaker in a criminal investigation. So voice is a much more than just a string of words. Although evidence from DNA grabs the headlines, but the fact is that DNA can't talk. It can't be recorded, planning, carrying out of or confusing to a crime. The voice of a person can be successfully used as a biometric feature. 
In the recent era, widely available facilities of telephones, mobile and tape recorder results on a, in the misuse of the device and thus making them an efficient tool in commission of criminal offense such as kidnapping, extortion, blackmailing, threats, and so on. So we understand that speech spectrography was a first developed at Bell Telephone Laboratory in 1941. Uh, in the United States, who is a witness of several discoveries, invention, modification, innovation in the journey of science and technology in the last hundreds of years, and was used for earlier military purpose during the World War II. It was not developed further until 1962 when LG Cresta conducted a study, the result of which indicated an approximate error rate of 1% in a voice identification based on a spectrogram examination. So one can understand how important tool it is. Now, the establishment of CBI, I think uh, everyone knows uh, uh, CBI, what uh, CBI stands for, Central Bureau of Investigation. Uh, it is a one uh, organization of government of India. So <clears throat> Central Bureau of Investigation traces its origin to the special police establishment which was set up in 1941 by the government of India. Functions of the SPE then were to investigate case of bribery, corruption in transactions, which the war supply department of India during Second World War II, and so on. So it is a widely engaged, like uh, now as well, you must have learned uh, now for the last two months ongoing investigation on several television channels about uh, let, uh, very uh, cute and very uh, say, promising actor Sushant Singh Rajput and CBI is uh, taking the case further to reveal the truth behind uh, the happening. So, uh, Dr. Singh, am I audible, Dr. Chaudhary? Yes, sir. Okay, great. It is clear. Yes. Yeah, great. I need 10, 12 minutes more, 15 minutes more, I think, maximum. How much time okay, do sir. I have? Sir, 15 minutes are there, okay? Only 15. So I have to wind up, say, in five, seven minutes so that we will have more time. So now, yes. right through in investigation by invention of instrumental techniques in forensic science. And these are some uh, important aspects. Now we come to the mathematical science because without mathematics, we can't do anything. If you don't know physics, you don't know chemistry or biology, that does not matter, but one should one must know mathematics. If not, people say, I think, not educated in the 21st century. So mathematics is one of the most powerful tool, which is widely used everywhere, especially in a science. We can't imagine science behind without mathematics. So <clears throat> as we know, the technology played an important role in the Second World War. Major advances in weaponry company industry by both sides impacted the way the war was fought and eventually the outcome in the war. So here I will focus only on artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, you know, it is one of the most important aspects of, uh, say, mathematical science, most finest discovery of mathematical science. And it was British mathematician and crypto analyst Alan Turing led the team that cracks Germany's in Enigma machine coding encryption during the World War II. Turing believed that the computer programs could be taught to think like a human, and he developed a hypothetical test to determine, the we uh, determine whether a machine could imitate a human well enough to, tool to fool another human or not. In 1948, Turing introduced many of the central concept of artificial intelligence, which utilize the mathematical coding theory and cryptography and so on. So, you know, the industry that are using the artificial intelligence, like manufacturing, healthcare, education, customer service, transportation, and everyone. Computer, computer have changed the world in many ways. They allow huge amount of information to be stored in a, a small place and so on. However, the history of a computer is uh, quite long ago, <clears throat> but in a modern age, 
we saw the computer and the internet, especially the internet. Internet was discovered in 1960. So usually it is believed that during 1957, the Cold War, World War between the United States and Russia, former USSR, due to the nuclear bomb, they dropped on Japan. They both were trying to, the situation was so worse that it was believed that uh, not anything can happen in the next minute. So the American military, they thought that how to save the data if nuclear attack happens from the side of USSR, that everything will destroy. So that was actually let force them to think and they have developed the internet and so they can save and store all the data in as various computers, really especially related to the defense. And that's how the internet was discovered in principle, in 1956, 57, we believe uh, the initial stage was, but officially it is a 1960. And then the mathematics, as I said, mathematics is the language of God, language of science, and so the language of internet operation from the binary number and describe text and images to the complex data structure of search engine for the World Wide Web. World Wide Web, it was discovered at so, sun at Switzerland in a 1989, if I'm not wrong. So, few of the major uses of internet are e-commerce, e-learning, knowledge sharing, social connectivity, variety of media, file transfer, communication, and so on. So, this is, you can see the internet in India by 2000, how much people are using the internet and so radio detection and ranging radar, discovery of radar. Radar was a new technology developed right before the World War II. It was the radar that somehow usually people believe that saved the Britain because it was discovered in England and they were hitting all the fighters coming from German side. And the German did not have idea that British they have discovered the radar. And they lost many a plane in last in a three months of continuous war. And finally, they thought the Germans thought that the British, their uh, their fighter fighter uh, pilots are very much uh, say uh, say expert. They are flying the plane very nicely, very carefully with the extra caution precaution. And so they are, we are not able to destroy them, but they are destroying us. Uh, later on, after several years, later they understood that it was, they have discovered the radar. So as soon as the German planes were entering into the British territory, they hit the uh, German planes and destroyed in the mid-air. And that somehow saved them as well. So now I think we have a lot of, we do not have much more time. So I will wind up just with some finest discovery in physics post second world war. So for example, I won't go to the detail, like a transistor, it was discovered by the John Bardeen in 1948 and he received Nobel prize. And later on, he also discovered the theory of, he gave the theory of superconductivity and for which he again, the second time received Nobel Prize for Physics, shared actually Nobel Prize with the uh, BCS uh, Bardin, Cooper and uh, Sniffer. Cooper and, with the Cooper and Sniffer, he shared the Nobel Prize for uh, developing the theory of superconductivity. So the transistor laser, laser was the another finest discovery in 1958 to 1960, it was, discovered and then accelerator technology in 1965 by the say uh, um, Stanford University scientist then coming to the high temperature superconductivity though superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by uh, Kamerlingen One from the University of Leiden Netherlands but the high temperature superconductivity was discovered in 1985 by say Paul Chu and his colleagues from the University of uh, University of uh, Houston. Yeah, University of Houston. He still heads the laboratory of superconductivity. And, uh, but unfortunately, um, Max Muller and his colleague from IBM Zurich received Nobel Prize for the high temperature superconductivity in a 19, 
86. Then coming to the Higgs boson, Higgs boson is also one of the finest discovery. It was discovered somewhere in 1961 and identified, uh, uh, say, verified in Sun after 2011, in 2010 11, and for which he received a Nobel Prize. Then coming to the gravitational wave detector, gravitational wave was predicted by Albert Einstein in 1915, but it was observed in LIGO and VIRGO, LIGO at California Institute of Technology, Caltech and Howard, and VIRGO at, <clears throat> say, Italy, INF and Padova. And fortunately, I had a directly uh, opportunity to work under uh, the, this LIGO and VIRGO project as a senior scientist, postdoc, uh, under European Research Council's advanced grant, so-called rare noise, and contributed Five papers out of that two were published in a physical review. So <clears throat> we have worked on uh, reducing the noise, so-called rare noise that can't be predicted. And if we reduce the noise, those rare noise, one can say detect the gravitational waves that was predicted by Albert Einstein that it was 1.3 billion years before the two black hole collided with the, each other and the rays emitted and it could be absorbed on the Earth's surface. And that's how the three legendary people, including, say, uh, um, uh, say the German physicist and two American, they received Nobel Prize in 2017. And then the nanotechnology. Of course, the nanotechnology, the concept was given by, uh, say, Richard Feynman in 1959. Um, Richard Feynman in a 1959 uh, in a say um, summit uh, gathering of uh, American Physical Society where he was invited and he gave a talk and so called the title of the talk was there is a plenty of room at the bottom. That means that was the time the scientist was approaching to the micro technology. So he was a theoretical physicist. So he advised that if you reduce the further the size size of <clears throat> the material uh, dimension of the material, you may have some intriguing properties. Though it is extremely difficult as you go down, reduce the dimension of a material, it would be much more technically difficult. But at the same time, the people tried, especially in a Bell Lab in 1975, and they received some signature. And further, later on, some people, some Germans, they had developed a AFM, Atomic Force Microscope, STM, Surface Tunneling Microscope, for which they also received Nobel Prize. And that was, uh, these are the powerful tool, including Raman spectroscopy to examine nanomaterials at a ultra high vacuum condition in a clean room. And uh, that led to uh, really a wide, uh, say, a spread of uh, scientific activities in this field. So these are the, actually, as I said, it is the tool. <clears throat> and uh, on top, you can see it is just a scanned tool. So here you can see micro, micro, and nano, the distinction in three. Like a micro, a big object like an apple. Micro, a human hair, you can see by the neck eye nano or a small very small <clears throat> say object you can't see with the net eye you need a spectroscopy or a afm or a stm or like uh, tools to see those uh, materials and examine their properties and so on these are some timeline tools and techniques carbon nanotube so <clears throat> yeah so this is the complete of my talk the first phase and Dr. Singh, how much time we do have? So we have five minutes. So one more minute I need. Just I go, I think uh, we have already, all my colleagues have already shown these transparencies about uh, GD Goenka, what we are doing. So these are some collaboration study abroad. This, this is the school belongs to the GD Goenka University. We are at the basic and applied sciences. This is the vision and mission you can find on the web page. This is a state of art of lab facilities. Here, this, all the faculty members, most of our faculty members are coming from the imminent uh, institution. Here, we have a plotted program, a running program. You can find also in our homepage. 
We introduce the experiential learning that provide a wide say, exposure to our student, such as interacting with the legendary people like a NASA scientist, Dr. Kumar. He has visited last year on 2019 to 22 August. Three days he stayed during the lecture. You can see interaction. P.V. Sharma, the eminent scientist, most influential academician of the country, established two technological universities, namely Bhopal, uh, Rajiv Gandhi Technological University at Madhya Pradesh, Bhopal, and Delhi Technological University. Recently, he is a vice chancellor at MIT. The DK, Dr. D.K. Ashwal, CSIR NPL director, second term director, as you can see, he is sitting with all our students. And he came last year on 25th of September, delivered the lecture, interacted with them. And also, we had a word with him that he has facilitated many of uh, our students for the internship and so on. Dr. Ram Kumar, Dean from the North Bihar Central University, <clears throat> addressing the student. This is the session on bioentrepreneurship, a career opportunity. Our faculty members, Dr. Kamle, Dr. Arora, Dr. Dhankar, and so on. Here we have invited M's, Dr. M's uh, scientist, Dr. Aswal, Dr. Jaiswal, and CBI, youngest director of CBI CFSS, SL, NB Burden, and so many. Here you can see the NPL visit, IIT visit, M's visit, and University of Delhi visit and so many other activities, national online conference. Here we have here international conference under collaboration of Arizona State University, World Environmental Summit. Here, this is a global sustainable program, outreach program. We do the teaching program for the children in a rural area, blood donation camp, organizing lecture, workshop, and so on, inviting school students plantation drive and so on. You can see we also go to visit the schools in a different zone. Dr. Uh, Himansu Arora visited uh, G.D. Goenka Public School at Durgapur, Siliguri. Here, Dr. Negi, G.D. Goenka University at uh, Noida, and uh, many of uh, our faculty members. Here, you can see Dr. Tiagi and colleagues, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, myself, and we have invited a student from a different secondary school, secondary, uh, senior secondary school, Batsapur. Doctor, here you can see science camp, all our faculty members, Dr. Sethi, Dr. Sasikant Gupta, Dr. Naresh Sharma, Dr. Praveen Kumar, and many more, all attendees, the student, the students are doing experiment and so on. We have a training and placement drive. These are the companies who are quite often visiting this is the placement our student got placed in a various industries. <clears throat> and these are some testimonials you can also find on the uh, our homepage or the GD Gwenka University homepage. That's all. So thank you so much indeed. So uh, am I, I completed my talk. Thank you so much yes. to all the faculty members and all the attendees. Yeah, please. Uh, Madam, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, My you pleasure. Explained, yeah. You explained how the science grew after the Second World War and how several scientists contributed to the society with their hard work. Many of them were awarded with the Nobel Prize for their efforts. I would like to add here that today also we are again facing a war-like situation due to COVID-19 pandemic and maybe the uh, maybe other uh, such similar threats. So we as scientists need to push ourselves to meet the challenges of the society. So participants, I would like to uh, to invite some questions from the participants. Uh, are there any questions? No question, sir. In chat box, there is no question. Uh, if okay. anyone wants to ask, he can, he or she can unmute. Yeah, right. if there are no questions, then I would like to ask a question because Professor Thakur has uh, uh, an expertise in low temperature physics and superconductivity. So, sir, my question to you is 
about the uh, superconducting materials. So, uh, if we are able to design a superconductor at room temperature today, how will it change the society? Well, very good question, Dr. Gupta. Actually, it is uh, one of the most intriguing aspects scientists are focusing across the world. You know, for example, if we have a superconducting material at a room temperature, we can save at least at least 80 to 90 percent of energy, whatever are consuming. You know, we will so because for everything we need energy, right? For example, for carrying uh, electricity from the say electricity station up to our house, it is carried through the copper wire because the copper has a very good thermal conductivity. No. The best yeah. thermal conductivity is uh, uh, that belong goes to the gold, followed by the silver, and then the copper. But the price is uh, quite different between gold, silver, and copper. So the copper is the cheapest. Copper one can find say just 300, 400 rupees per kilogram. But if you talk about the gold, one kilogram it is a 30 lakh, 40, 40 lakh per kilogram. So the copper, the cheapest material is utilized. But the calculation says that whatever the power, the uh, station, power station uh, delivers for the consumer, when we get it, we get hardly 10%, 20% power. So roughly 70 to 80% power loss is through the transmission. So if we have a superconducting, say, material uh, wire at a room temperature to carry the electricity we can save almost maximum power and so for the vehicle or other uh, aspects running the vehicle or industry you know we do not need this kind of the fuel or uh, some other uh, means to run the industry right yeah thank you sir very nicely explained so, uh, can I say that uh, if we are able to uh, design a superconductor at room temperature, uh, then maybe the biggest problem of our society, which is the uh, right. energy crisis. So, maybe we can solve this energy crisis problem. Yeah, of course. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. Praveen Kumar, although sir has already mentioned, uh, uh, he has again asked, how important is this science and technology education in the present context? Well, you see, it is a really very much intriguing subject. Thank you so much for the question, Dr. Gupta. And to the, uh, I think, who asked your question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar, sir. Okay. Dr. Praveen Kumar, thank you so much. So, as you know, the science is actually the building block, you know, building block of the progress. on the progress and prosperity belongs, especially in the 20th century. Whatsoever the progress we absorbed in 19th or 20th century, it is just because of the science and technology. What's the train, telecommunication, computer, or superconductors, or uh, say <clears throat> environmental aspects, or in the current scenario, artificial intelligence. All is due to the science and technology. So science and technology is somehow just two sides of one coin. If we want technology, we must have good understanding of science. And through the science, we can develop technology, innovate it, modify it, improve it, and use it for the societal benefit. Like for water, say purification is one of the biggest challenge or the air we need we need an instrument from where it this come this come from the technology how the technology improved or built there is a science is behind that so through the several different techniques we are say purifying the water we are trying to purify the uh, air and so on so science and technology is really very much important for the progress of society in present context. Okay, sir. Thank you very nicely. You summarized it. 
Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Dr. Praveen, for asking the question. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I thank think you. there is one yeah. more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ankit Sen is asking, Shashikant Gupta, he is asking me, uh, what is neutrino action mechanism? So, Ankit, uh, maybe we can discuss in detail later, but I will just summarize that there are three types of neutrinos, and uh, uh, so we call three flavor of neutrinos. And these three neutrinos, sometimes they, they the flavor changes, so means they convert into each other. So we have electron neutrino, tau neutrino, and one more. So sometimes electron neutrino becomes tau neutrino and vice versa. So this is basically the neutrino action mechanism. We can discuss it in detail later. Okay. So uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, add here that there is a message for the young scientists, young students. So the message is that learning the concept is not sufficient. Plan some activities to use the concept to solve a problem for the society. So this right. is the mantra which will take you forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank for, you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yes, sir. I am summarizing thank all you. this. I am a great fan of Nelson Mandela. So the Nelson Mandela once during the, say, Nuclear is, he was asked by the journalist, series of journalists, what could be the best weapon. And he, Nelson Mandela, without losing any time, he replied that education. Education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. And I'm sure everyone must be uh, convinced with his statement. And we believe that the only way to build and uh, sustain a more or a just the sustainable world to achieve and sustain for now and the future in current scenario is through the education, especially with the science education, with the special emphasis on science education. As we know, the science is the foundation on which the progress and prosperity of various European nations built and the impressive progress which the Western countries have made has been possible only due to the scientific knowledge. In fact, it is because of the scientific inventions that human beings have survived in the world populated by the adversaries, which are physically more stronger, stronger and more powerful than him. So it is because of the power placed to the disposal of man that he could conquer disease even like a corona in current scenario as well. Everyone is looking toward the scientists. They are not looking toward the management personality. They are not looking toward the administrator. They are not looking to the statesman. Nobody asks to any prime minister, yeah, please prepare the medicine, vaccination. Everyone is asking, looking toward the scientific community, right? So the, it is, so it is due to the science we could conquer the disease and hunger and overcome the physical infirmity to tame the awesome forces of nature even in corona cycle. So I do believe that we have to always identify the societal need and accordingly we should utilize our knowledge, our wisdom to rectify the problem, to solve the societal problem by means of science education. That's what my message is. And thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Renu Chaudhary and your thank team, you. Dr. Kamle, Dr. Sonika Sethi, and of course, Dr. Uh, uh, Sachikan Gupta for moderating the session. And all the LabNet members, faculty members, students who have joined this talk, it is for you. We do hope that next days as well, you will come and attend the session, the next imminent session is, uh, I think, uh, I can see on the... Uh, yes, sir. Here. Sir, I yes, have sir, Dr. Rupert Dicker. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Rupert Dicker, the CEO. Yeah, Dr. Renzing, you can <coughs> introduce the talk to the audience, and I may take all your leave. Thank you so much, indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. 
for such a nice session. Thank you so much, Sushikant sir. Uh, there is Thank one you. announcement for next session of Eminent Scientist webinar series. The speaker will be Dr. Rupert Ecker on September seventh, twenty twenty. Uh, the topic will be this will be the science in industry experiences in a globalized world and you may join the session using the zoom meeting and meeting id you can see in this presentation our time will be 12:30 to 1:30 thank you so much for attending the session thank you so much all of you thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you everyone Great. Thank you, so sir. So take very good care of yourself. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you next Thank time. Thank you, sir. For such Thank a nice you. session. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.